fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers to accomplish his plan. Good morning and welcome to my father's place. It is the season in which the church celebrates the birth of Christ. And I'm going to speak to that today by telling you why he came. Welcome. And may you hear these words. It will be for you, whether you're a believer or not, it will be life-changing if you will hear what he says and take it to heart. I'm going to pray. We're going to be in Isaiah starting with 52.13 and going through 53.8, because really the last part of 52 should be in chapter 53. Men decided the chapters, and so they missed this one. So I'm going to pray, and then we'll get into it. Father, every time I come to this word, I am amazed at your grace and your mercy and your love for us. Every time I come to this word, I bow down and worship you and praise your holy name. Lord Jesus, I praise you. What you did was more than any of us would do for each other. Thank you for doing it. Holy Spirit, may you speak through me. May you glorify the Father and the Son. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to read this whole passage. And with great desire from the Lord that it be worship to him. That these words be an adoration of him. For he is worthy. I wanted to say, why on earth, Lord, do I need to teach this to the church why you came? And he said, it's because most people who go to church do not know why I came. So I'll begin with 52.13 in Isaiah and go down through Isaiah 53.8. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were astonished at you, so his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them, they will see. And what they had not heard, they will understand. 53.1 Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely, our griefs 
he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being, that word means peace, fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter. And like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? The stroke was due to me. The stroke was due to you. But who considered it, beloved? Who considered it? Why he came? Because of his obedience to the Father. Because he did what no man could do. That is, he provided salvation and reconciliation with God. He will prosper. He succeeded in what he was sent to do. When he was on the cross, he cried, it is finished. He succeeded in what he was sent to do. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted by all who see the reason for his coming. For all who see why he came. They will exalt him greatly beloved. Because we in ourselves cannot do what he did. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot reconcile ourselves. He did it. Why he came. Now. Many were astonished at him in 14. His appearance was marred more than any man. In his form more than the sons of man. Many were appalled. That's what astonished means. He was marred. He was disfigured as he hung on that cross. His beard was pulled out from Isaiah 50, verse 6. His bones were exposed. Read Psalm 22 and see King David's vision of what it was like for the Christ to hang on a cross. He was stricken first by the Jewish leaders because he wouldn't answer them. And then he was beaten mercilessly by the Roman soldiers. Then they scourged him, the Romans did, with whips. These were whips that at the end of each cord was a sharp object so that when it was flung at his back and his front and pulled back, it stripped him of his skin. They skinned him with it. So he was nearly unrecognizable as human, marred. He was marred. He was disfigured. 
He was barely recognizable as a human being, the body of a human being. The severity of his punishment matched the extremity of our need for a savior and a reconciler, beloved. Before he was even on the cross, he lost most of his blood as they tore his skin off his body and beat him. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. With what? With his blood. When the lamb was offered on the altar, the blood was sprinkled as an atonement for sin. This is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist proclaimed. He shed his blood in such a horrible way for you and for me because it was the only way that we could be saved from the wrath of God and reconciled to him. The only way. So kings, that is, of other nations, will shut their mouths, not in horror, but in recognition that they are not God. And there is one God who sent his son, even for them. Oh, church, this is why he came. Why will they shut their mouths? Because they're going to hear what they had not heard, see what they had not seen, and understand what they had not understood. Because there would be people that would go forth, even if they were not present at that cross, there would be those who would go forth, equipped, filled with the Holy Spirit, saved, sanctified, reconciled, who would speak this gospel to the world, to the world. Not only would they be equipped to speak it, but they would be equipped to live it. Glory to God. But here's the thing. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The arm of the Lord is revealed to the ones who believe this message that Isaiah is going to speak in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit directly from the mouth of God. What is the arm of the Lord? It's his power. It's his resurrection power. Oh, I pray that you would have in you his resurrection power. If you have understood the purpose of his resurrection, that you would cry out for his resurrection power. Resurrection first from being dead in your sins. And then his resurrection power in you, filling you. May you know, may you experience personally this power. Paul said to the Ephesians in 119 and 20, he said, I'm praying this prayer for you, O believers in Ephesus 
that you will know, that you will personally experience what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward those who believe. In accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Resurrection power. The power of God. Releasing you from the death that you were in and raising you up. Born from above. And then coming into you so that that power resides in you so that you may go forth and speak and live it. Hallelujah. So Jesus grew up before the father as a tender shoot like a root out of dry ground. He was born into a human woman's body, conceived by the Holy Spirit. He grew up from infancy out of dry ground. What is that dry ground? It's the parched spiritual condition of the land of his people, Israel. It was miraculous that a tender shoot could spring up from that, but he came to water Israel and the whole world with his living water. To spiritually water their spiritual drought. Through the hardened ground, he came up. Through many years with no prophetic word from God, he came up. from hearts hardened so that they followed the rules but didn't know the rule maker. Tender shoot. But he had, he didn't fit the profile, beloved. He had no stately majesty no nothing, no stately form that we should look on him and say, oh, there he is, our Savior. There he is, our Messiah. There he is, our Christ. Oh, he's the one. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. No, there was nothing to indicate that. He looked very average in every way. He had no appearance He didn't look like someone we should say, ah, it's him. He was supposed to come in, according to the Jews, as a savior from Roman rule and slavery. That's the one they were waiting for. They were waiting for the Christ, the Messiah, to come in on a white horse leading a huge army that was going to overwhelm Rome and free them. They were under Roman rule according to the Lord's desire that they would understand that their need is much more than for physical freedom, but for freedom from the power of sin. Oh, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Glory to God. Nobody looked on him with awe. He wasn't matching what they thought he should be. Who are you? And as he hung on that cross, we despised him. We scorned him. We said, look at that. What kind of Christ is he? What kind of savior is he? What kind of Messiah is he? 
He's hanging on a cross. He can't even save himself. Why should we have any regard for him whatsoever? And most of the world will look at Jesus on the cross and say, that's defeat. But it was victory. You will see it. Even his disciples forsook him. He knew that they would. But he knew that the father would be with him until that very moment on the cross. Where he spoke from the Psalms and said. Eloi, Eloi, Sabachthani. My father, my father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that moment, he carried your sins and mine. And the father and he had to be separated for the first time in eternity. You wonder why he prayed to the father, is there any other way? (laughs) It was so we would know there was no other way. He fully intended to do it. Never think, never think that there was any question in his mind. He was completely obedient, perfect, and sinless. It was so we would know. That's why he wanted his disciples to be near enough to hear. There is no other way to be reconciled than by his death. There is no other way to be saved from the wrath of God than by his death. The extremity of our need is reflected in the severity of the punishment he endured for you and me. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Sorrows means pains. Grief means sicknesses. It wasn't that he was full of pain and sickness until he hung on that cross, then he surely did. But he saw the pain and sickness spiritually of his people. He saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd and that they were oppressed by illness and that many were possessed by demons. And he delivered them. And yet as we looked at him on that cross, we said, ah, I can't even look. This is gross. Ah, he's skinned. He's beaten. He doesn't even look like a human being. I can't look. And we said, how absurd that such a thing would be done by the one who's supposed to rescue us so that we can have everything that we want. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Now this word bore means carried away, lifted off. And then our sorrows he carried means he took the heavy load from us. And that means both our spiritual pain and sickness and physical pains and sicknesses, just as Matthew confirms in 8.17. He carried them. Actually, I'll start with Matthew 16. When evening came, they brought to him 
many who were demon possessed and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were ill. Verse 17, this was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. It was to prove he was the one spoken of here because God has always healed in the Old Testament and the New. But it was to prove that he was God the Son. He did things no man could do. He said, if you don't believe me for any other reason, if you don't believe I'm the one sent by my father, then believe because of the works that I do. God works. So even though on the cross he was carrying our spiritual pain and sorrow and grief and sickness, we didn't esteem him. We considered him stricken. We said, how can this be the Christ? God is letting him die this way? He can't be. God has stricken him. We considered him afflicted. That word afflicted means we looked down on him with disdain. That can't possibly be true. He can't possibly be the one. But just as surely as with the previous verse, surely, just as surely, here is why he came. Do not miss it. It is magnificent. Awesome and worthy of praise and adoration for the rest of our days. He was pierced through for our transgressions, yours and mine. He was pierced through for our rebellion. We should have been pierced through, but he was on our behalf. We should have received all the punishment that he received. He was crushed, broken into pieces, beaten to pieces, crushed. Not a bone was broken, but beaten to pieces. For your and my iniquities, our perversity in the eyes of God. Do you see it? Do you see that the severity of his punishment shows us just how much we needed a savior and a reconciler? Oh my goodness. Jesus. The chastening punishment for our well-being, that is our shalom, our peace with God, our reconciliation, the punishment fell upon him. What we deserved, what I deserved, what you deserved, fell on him. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And by his scourging, that whip, and the skinning of him, we are healed. We are healed. But I want to tell you that this is spiritual healing here and no other. If you use this to claim physical healing, you rob this of its power and its truth. 
because God has always healed. So healing didn't begin at the cross. He healed while he was walking around. He didn't need to die on a cross for your physical healing. Beloved, he died to heal your relationship with the Father. He endured all that for you so that you could be reconciled to God and at peace with him. Delivered from being under God's wrath. John 3, 36. John the Baptist said, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life. But the wrath of God will remain on him, abides on him. By his scourging, by the intensity of what he underwent, by the extremity of that, we see our extreme need. That God would have to go to that length. Beloved. To save us and reconcile us to him. Passing from death to life. We pass from death to life. Because he died on a cross. Yes, he rose. Amen. Glory to God on the third day. That also was to prove he is who he says he is. But this is why he came to die for you and for me. To bear what we should bear for punishment. In John 5, 24, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death and into life. Life! Life in God, eternal life, life as God has it, here and now and there and then. That is why he came. He came because we were helpless. There was no way we could be good enough to get out from under God's wrath. There was no way we could fix ourselves so that we did not rebel. Verse 6, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all. Oh, what a burden he bore to fall on him. The iniquity of us all. See, the good news is that God the Father sent his son to bear your rebellion, your perversity, And your disobedience. Everything. Now it says to fall on him. But the word really is to meet in him. And that word meet means he seeing the sin of the world and knowing he was The only solution stepped in, stretching his arms on that cross to bridge the gap between humanity and God. He interceded for us. That is what meat means. Once for all. I look at this and I bow 
I hope you are bowing now. I hope you see it. This is why he came. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before it shears, verse 7. So he did not open his mouth. He didn't say, hey, you can't do that to me. I'm the Christ. He silently took what we deserved. The lamb, like a lamb, led to slaughter. He was slaughtered for you and me. Verse 8, by oppression and judgment, by false judgment, by oppression by the leaders, when he stood before them and they judged him falsely, he was taken away. That is, he died. And as for his generation, that is all of those since his coming, beloved, who considered that he was cut off, removed, died, that he was cut off from the land of the living. Why? For the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. For your transgression for your iniquity, for your sin. He was cut off from the land of the living. Jesus, my Lord, you came to save the ones who took your life away. I looked upon your blood-stained cross, my sin, the cause for your life lost. You came to make my blind eyes see, to free me from sin's evil grip. How strange that you were captive made to set the wicked prisoner free. <gasps> That's why he came. Beloved, now he's asked me to speak some words to the church. You remember in the beginning I said, why, why do I need to teach this? Why do I need to preach this? And he said, because many people who go to church don't know why I came. Why would they not know? Because no one tells them in the church. My goodness, no one speaks of the real reason because people might be offended and feel bad about themselves. So churchgoers are taught that Jesus came to find out what it was like to be us so that he could understand us. They are taught that he came because we needed to know who the father is and he was going to show us who the father is. Yes, he did, but that is not why he came. They say Jesus came to do good things. Oh, he did so much more than good things, beloved. You have just heard what he did. We are even taught in the church that Jesus came to make your life better. He came to take you from death, spiritual death, to life in him. So by teaching such things, the church has willfully made him unrecognizable 
as unrecognizable as he was on the cross, they have made him unrecognizable as the Savior and Reconciler. He did not fit the profile the Jews expected, and we have changed his profile. We have created a Jesus who we are comfortable with and who soothes our consciences, beloved. We have formed him into our own image so that he is just like us. If he was just like us, this would have meant nothing. Today's church has willfully made him unrecognizable for the Jesus taught in today's church is nothing like the Jesus of this word. He does not look like in the church today, the Jesus who called both believers and unbelievers to repentance. Matthew 4, 17, from that time, from that time on, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Therefore, just as the Jews completely missed the purpose of his coming, the church does too. Our leaders and teachers willfully distort the truth. They know the truth. Many of them do, but they distort it. Just as the Jews did when Jesus walked the earth. So as to keep their position of leadership and keep the pews filled, because we don't want to tell anyone that they are sinners in need of a savior and reconciler. All this that he did. And we say things like he died to make your life better. No, he died to give you life. He died to give you life. Glory to God. Don't miss it. Don't miss it, beloved. So the Spirit-inspired Peter tells us what our response should be to Isaiah 53. First Peter 2.21 through 2.24. For you have been called for this purpose. Once you realize and bow low and worship and adore and praise him, for what he has done once you see the truth. Then you're a called one for this purpose. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was there any deceit found in his mouth. 1 Peter 2.23, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. Why? So that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. That's our response. We die to sin. We Cry out to the Lord, oh Lord, I have seen why you came, forgive me. I repent. Save me. Reconcile me. And oh Lord, I know I must die to sin, just like you died on the cross for my sin. I need to die to that thing inside me that prompts me to sin at the dangling of a carrot by Satan. I need that, Lord. This is what he's saying. So that you die to sin and live to righteousness, filled with God's righteousness, filled with his spirit, purified in your heart. 
His divine nature replacing the sin nature. His divine nature replacing the sin nature. So you died to sin and you live to righteousness. Pure, refined by the refiner. That should be our response. Take up your own cross and follow him to your own crucifixion of that sin nature in you. Beseech the Lord to crucify your sin nature. Just like Paul says in Galatians 5.24, and as he says in Galatians 2.20, you will be able to say with Paul, I am crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but he lives in me. And the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. You will be able to say that. Glory to God. Considering all that the Father and the Son have done, your sacrifice, your sacrifice, is to offer yourself, just like in Romans 12.1, As a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing, it is your spiritual act of worship to say, oh, kill out that sin nature in me. Put your nature in me. Come in and dwell in me fully so that I can follow in the steps of Jesus. So that I can die to what he died that I could die. We can't die to sin until we recognize that he died for our sins. But then we can die. And then he can live in us. Hallelujah. You live for him instead of yourself, beloved. He didn't come to make your life better. He came to give you life. His life. It's glorious. should make you fall down and worship him to know what he has done. If you have heard, if you have had ears to hear, it will. Lord Jesus, I pray that many will hear. I pray that many will see. I pray that many will understand. I pray that many will repent. I pray that many will be saved and reconciled. I pray that many will ask you to crucify their sin nature. Many will follow and do what they must do in order to walk like you walk and be as you are. A witness for him that yes, All of this is true, and it has happened in me. Holy Spirit, send this forth in your power. In Jesus' name, amen. The fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers to accomplish his plan and pour out his spirit.